Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Wassalatu Wassalamu Ala Rasulillah, Amma Ba'ud. I'm going to ask very humbly and very nicely for our young, young brothers from the masjid to pay attention and to have adab in the masjid and to behave in the masjid. I don't know how the people are in this masjid, but in the masjid where I come from, where I am, we like to have a lot of rahmah for our youngsters, but we don't tolerate playing around in the masjid because the masjid, the goal and the objective, the reason why we have the masjid so that we can pray, we can get close to Allah. And although it's okay to talk and even maybe to laugh, but it shouldn't get out of hand. And when our youngsters come to the masjid and they're left like this, some of them unsupervised, then they become the responsibility for everybody here. If the father knows that his children are not going to behave, then he should keep his child next to him. But if he can leave his child unsupervised to be a man, to be mature, to sit there and listen, and not to bother the other people who are around him, and to bother the other people who come to the masjid, then this is a good thing. So we want to ask our youngsters, not only today, but all the time, guys, when you come to the masjid, you have to feel that this is a special place. You can't put gum under the table, on the chair, you can't spit in the corner even if no one's looking at you. You can't take the Quran, the Quran home with you even though no one's looking at you. You can't take a pen and write on the Quran because this is Allah's house. This is Allah's house. Allah doesn't live in this house. He doesn't live here. But this is the place where He designated for the people to come. He told the people, come at this place, come together and worship me in this place. He didn't say come to this place and act like a zoo. It's not a zoo. It's a place where we have to take it easy. So if I want to talk to Abu Jibril, I talk to him no problem. And I talk to him in a nice way. Now, one of the reasons why the kids, they act the way they do, one of the many reasons is when they look around, they're competing with the voices of the other people in the mischief. So if the children, they saw from those who are older than them, they saw from their set of people with them right now, who are older than them, that we behaved in the masjid a particular way. That behavior on us, from us, is going to have a knock-on effect. They're just going to know this is something you don't do. So it's not all your fault, guys. But while I'm here, though, I want you guys to stay focused, inshallah, take it easy. And I ask Allah to give all of you a good life and put noor between your eyes when you walk down the street. There's noon coming out, and you know what you're doing. Now, when we talk about the characteristics of al Sunnah, a lot can be said. And I wanted to add on two more things because of something that happened in the masjid today. That is carry on from this. It's an extension from this. When I came into the masjid, I arrived late, and I prayed the third and the fourth rata. When I came into the masjid, in the back of the masjid, there were about nine or ten youngsters sitting on the wall, and you guys had already prayed to rata. And I'm not talking about youngsters like these little brothers here, these little brothers. I'm talking about teenagers. Now, I wondered to myself, what is going on with them? Because before you can start giving advice before you can start making an assessment, you gotta know what's going on. I was on the bus in Birmingham one time in the month of Ramadan, and an aging lady got on the bus and she was eating, and one of the brothers called himself giving Dao and he said, how are you eating in Ramadan? Why are you eating in daylight time in Ramadan? She said, I'm not even a Muslim, what are you talking about? I'm not even a Muslim. So before you try to call yourself giving her dawah, hey, take it easy. Maybe it's better to leave her alone altogether because she's a woman and it's not your business because she may have an excuse that's embarrassing for her to mention that. So maybe something like that, just be quiet. So the point is, before you make an Amr bin Maruf and Nayan al you have to assess the situation. I try to assess this thing and that's why I'm talking to you about it right now and I hope that Allah gives me the tawfiq 
to plant the seed in your hearts and mind to know the importance of what I'm trying to do here. I came into the masjid, the young kids, the boys, teenagers, were sitting in the back of the masjid. I said, if they're travelers, they still have to pray. Whatever the situation is, they were in the school, they still have to pray. I said to them, hey, what are you guys doing sitting here? And they started looking at each other, like to ignore me. They were looking at each other. So it's not about they disrespected me. I'm telling you what happened. This was the behavior, the response. They looked at each other with no answer. No intelligent answer. Couldn't articulate himself. Why are you sitting there? What's your answer? And the person is going to be asked, Yomo Kiyama, and that's his response for the one who doesn't know what he's doing. Shaitan beguiled him. So he'll be asked, who's your Lord? He's going to look around and say, I don't know. I don't know. He won't have an intelligent excuse or reason. So I said to them, come on guys, get up and pray. And one of them actually got angry with me for telling him to get up and pray. And he got up and he wouldn't pray. He was looking around and looking back at me. I did my job, so I didn't want to feed into that. So I started the prayer. After the prayer, there was another brother who came, an adult. He came with his children, prayed next to him. He made two rakat and he missed two. He made two, last two of the imam. So I went to him and I said, alaikum, alaikum salam. He was very nice. And I said, I don't know, but what did you do? Because we prayed together. He said, well, I came from Manchester, I think he said. So I'm a traveler, I already prayed. So I was told I should just join in with the Imam. The Imam prayed too, I prayed too. He had an excuse. He didn't know that whenever you pray with the Imam, even if you're praying to Rakas, like in this case, you're praying with the Imam, you should do what the Imam is doing. The Imam has been made to be followed. So I also have to only pray to our gods because I'm traveling. But because I'm behind that Imam, I have to do what he's doing. But what impressed me about that brother was he was easy and gentle. He wanted to learn. And we all are in a position where we have to learn. So what's the point here? The point here, guys, is with so many kids sitting on that wall in the back of the masjid, I think it says something about your masjid. I think it says something about this masjid. It's like my house in your house. If someone comes into your house, someone sees your wife walking in the street, someone sees us doing certain things, you can get an idea about what's going on. You can get an idea. This little boy, when you meet him for the first time, he gives you the water with his right hand, he takes it with his right hand, he's drinking it with his right hand, he's eating with his right hand. He's doing certain things you see, this kid he has training. Does it mean his mother and father from the malaika? Kalla wallahi. Doesn't mean that. But you get an indication. People are paying attention to that boy. But if you see other than that, and it's extreme, there's an indication attention is not being paid. This masjid is just as much my masjid as anybody else. If I came here and I got in the first row, nobody can come in the city of Huddersfield and say, hey, so-and-so built the masjid, you have to get up and give him this place. The only person who can do that to me is Isa ibn Maryam Salawatullahi wa salam wa Because he's a Nabi, a Rasul. So whatever you say, I have to do it. Nobody else can do that because the Prophet gave me that right. Allah gave me that right. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So since it's my masjid, I don't want anybody to feel I'm making a personal attack on you. It's not an attack. This is for everybody. Now, I'm sure there were some people who came in the masjid and you were just busy. I had to get in the line, so you got in the line. And I'm also sure that some people went and talked to them. But it was all of our responsibility. The people who came in and we saw that situation, we have to say to those kids, hey, what are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? What's going on with you? Because the masjid, again, as I told you, the masjid, it belongs to all of us. And that's the first thing we'll talk about concerning Ahlul Sunnah. And the Sunnah and Khwani are the people who have a lot of characteristics, a lot. I just do with a few here today, very quickly even, inshallah, very quickly. And one of the main characteristics of Ahl Sunnah is this issue of giving nasiha to one another, advising one another. 
one of the great scholars of Al Islam. He's the muhaddith of this era, Rahimullah Ta'ala. He asked his students, do you people know which ayat of the Quran describes the brotherhood better than anything else? Do you know which ayat of the Quran or which dalil from the Quran and the Sunnah describes the brotherhood of Islam the most? So the people started saying different ayat and different ahadith. Seven people would be in the shade of Allah, under the shade of Allah, and the day there would be no shade. He said, well, that's the virtue of the brotherhood. The Shaykh was now said, the al al-ban, rahmatullahi alayhi. He said, no, that's the virtue. He said, the next person said, what about the hadith, ya Shaykh? None of you truly believes until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. None of you truly believes. He said, that's also from the characteristics of the brotherhood. So they start saying ayahs ahadith. One of the people said, what about the ayah of the surah wal asr in the insan ala fi khus? Inna alladheena aminu wa aminu salihat wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. He said, this is it right here. It's this surah right here. All of the people in the state of loss, except those people who believe in Allah, they do righteous deeds, and they mutually advise one another. They advise each other on the truth, and they advise each other towards sabr, and also towards rahmah, because there's another ayat, ثُمَّ كَانَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا ثُمَّ كَانَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَوَاصُوا بِالْصَبْرِ وَتَوَاصُوا بِالْمَرْحَمَةِ They also give nasiha with rahmah. So the point here is, the Shaykh went on to explain, and this is the point, It's easy for someone to advise someone else who may not be his friend. And it's easy to advise your friend about something that is not really a big problem. But it's not very easy to advise someone about something that he doesn't like. He's your friend. And you love him and he loves you. God's got a good relationship. But you don't make mujamina to him. You don't, you know overlook the truth and compromise the truth. You tell them straight up, in a nice way, of course. Hey, I think you're a bit tough. I think you're a bit too rough with your children. I think that you are this, you are that. Hey, Ahi, this thing that you are doing is not the right thing. He knows his brother is not going to like it. He may even have a repugnant smell coming from him. He may have a smell that comes from him, but his friend, it's not going to leave him like that. His friend is going to say in a nice way, not to hurt him, hey, this is happening and that's happening. And he'll do it in the best way so that the individual will accept the truth. He won't do it in a rough way. And this is one of the characteristics of Ahasun. They advise those people who are around them in the best way, inshallah, hoping not to make people upset, that's not the goal and the objective to advise people to put them down and put yourself up. The goal and the objective is not to have a dig at the person. The goal and the objective is maybe he didn't know. And the believer is a mirror to his brother. You look in the mirror, you see your reflection, and you adjust your hat or whatever based upon what you see in the mirror. That's how we represent each other. But the condition of the Muslim today is we're suspicious of each other right off the bat. We don't like each other right away. We have so many issues that prevent us from just telling each other, hey, this and that and this and that. I mean, you tell them the right way. But the people who try and strive to be from the people of the Sunnah, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Sunnah told us, advise each other. Someone would come and he would accept Islam. He would take the Prophet's hand for the bay'ah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet would say to him, I accept your Islam under the condition that you give advice to every Muslim that you meet. And the man would think about it. Because he knows he's serious about accepting Islam. But this is a condition now you're taking from the Nabi. He would think about it. And then he would say, okay. And then everybody he came in contact with, he felt it was his duty, his job, responsibility to give advice. So if it wasn't important, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Sunnah 
wouldn't have pointed to this issue the way it points to it. He said the religion is giving advice, the religion is giving advice, religion is giving advice three times in order to make the emphasis for someone who didn't hear, for someone who has doubt. So that's the way of the people of the Sunnah. Wal Jama'ah. What's the Jama'ah? By giving advice to people, our community and our group will stay together. Because usually the person who needs advice is doing something that compromises the integrity of unity. Usually. It may be on a family level, it may be in a mischief, but usually the one who needs advice, he's doing something that's going to compromise the unity, the brotherhood. He owes the man money. His friend owes someone else money. He comes and says, I it's not right what you're doing. Don't make that man chase you around like that. Because what's going to happen is, he's going to stop speaking to you and the Jamaat gets compromised. What's going to happen, you guys are going to get into a fight. And then it's going to escalate. And then his sons are going to come and your sons, his tribe and your tribe. And on and on and on and on and on. So, and the Sunnah and Jamaat. One of the main characteristics, and we can scream and make slogans as long as we want, as loud as we want. One of the most important characteristics of and the Sunnah, well, Jamaat, is to be a person who gives advice to everybody who's around you in a way that's appropriate. We're going to advise the Muslim leader in a way that's appropriate. We're going to advise the Imam of the Masjid in a way that's appropriate. We're going to advise an elder person, our uncle, mothers, fathers. The wife is going to advise her, her husband in a way that's appropriate. So we have to know the different levels and conditions and situations, the nuances. Also, in addition to that, this issue of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, I have to go back. Where does this term come from? Is this a term that someone came up with recently? This term extends all the way back to the time of the companions. The Prophet didn't say it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But it was present during the time of the companions of the Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran, there is an ayat in Surah Ali Imran, ayat number 106. For those of you who want to go back and you want to check it. Allah Ta'ala mentioned one of the things that's going to happen in Yom Qiyamah. On that day, the faces of some people is going to be white. And the faces of other people is going to be black, dark. As for those people who come and their faces are black and dark, it will be said to them, have you disbelieved after your Iman? Now taste the punishment of what you disbelieved in. And as for those people whose faces will be white and illuminated, it will be said that they will be in the Rahmah of Allah forever. Now if someone wanted to be a criminal, as I saw some criminals when I first came into Islam, some African American criminals, they were ignorant. When they were Christians, they saw the institutionalized racism in Christianity, just as is in Sikhism, Hinduism, and Judaism. You can find ayat in their books, statements from their learning, showing racism is supported in the religion. We have racists. We have Muslims who are racist. They're racist towards people from their own country. The Muslims from the Gulf states are racist towards each other, different tribes. The Muslims in the Gulf state, they are racist towards the Arabs in North Africa. For an example, Egyptians, Syrians. And Egyptians are racist, and Syrians are racist. Pakistanis, we're racist amongst ourselves and against Bangladeshis and so forth. Africans, racist. Racism is a problem. Anyway, anyway. We have Muslims who are racist, but you cannot take this book. You hear me, man? You cannot take this book and show where it supports racism. This book is the Quran. You know that. We have a new Muslim here. This book does not support racism. Instead, it knocks the head off of racism, chops its head off. And the Sunnah does the same thing. It dispels that myth. Anyway, as I mentioned, these people, they use this ayat to show, they use these ayahs to show, look, we can't really believe everything in the Quran because the Arabs, they put this in there. The day that the people's faces will be black, 
meaning like us. That I is not saying that. This I is talking about blackness not as a color like we have black. Blackness as a state of a condition that comes from kufr, that comes from misbehaving. So they're going to be black. Whatever color that black is, whatever shade is not important. But no Muslim in his right mind can come and say, hey, that's the ayat of racism. Another ayat said that Allah will raise up some people, Yom Al-Qiyamah, and they'll have eyes that are zarqa, blue eyes. So that means white people are good. Hey, hey, hey. The Quran is not saying that. This is why we always have to go back to understanding the tafsir of the Quran based upon what the salaf of this ummah mentioned. In that ayat about the black faces and the white faces, Abdullah ibn Abbas, if you go back to the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, you'll find that Abdullah ibn Abbas said, the faces of Ahl Sunnah will be white, and the faces of the people of innovation will be dark. That's the meaning of the ayat. So Ibn Kathir, he brought this ether, he brought this ether, and the reason why I'm mentioning it to you guys right now is to show you and to illustrate. This concept of Ahl Sunnah is not something that is new. This is something that goes all the way back when Al Islam was in the infant stage. From the characteristics of Ahl Sunnah and their meaning. Really, the first one that I wanted to mention before I mention that thing that happened is that the people of the Sunnah and the Sunnah and Jama'at they have this characteristic that is established in the Quran and the Sunnah and that's the characteristic of purity at tahara at tahara the Muslim who's a Muslim and his tahara is being compromised is something wrong with his Islam and the tahara has many meanings and the Sunnah, the most important characteristic is a tahara, purity. And there are two types of purity that they have. One type of purity is the most important one. The purity where you don't have shit connected to you. That you don't have the dirt and the evil of kufr and shit. Because when the Prophet came, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he battled against and shook Billah, he battled against it. And he did not lose an opportunity except to address this point. So the people of the Sunnah, they have that thing of purity. Look what Allah said in the Quran that is also misunderstood. Innam al mushrikun al najis. Verily, the mushrikun are najis. Everybody knows what najasa is. When you go to the toilet, Akramakumullah, what comes out of you is najasa. You can't get it on your body. You have to get it off of your body. And there's big najasa and small najasa. Allah described the mushrikun as being najis. The meaning of this najasa is not necessarily in their body. So you can shake their hands. He allowed the Muslim man to marry a woman who's a Jew or a Christian. So you can be affectionate and touch the person who's a non-Muslim. You can give them change. I saw a Muslim in his store working and he drops the money in their hands like that. He drops it. Why do you do that, man? Because Allah said the mushrikun and nejis. I don't want to touch them. Hey, that's not the meaning of the ayat. That's not the meaning. The meaning of najasa here primarily means the kufr and the shirk. Allah said in another ayat of the Quran, فَاجْتَنِبُوا الرِّجْسِ مِنَ الْأَوْثَانِ Stay away from the filth and the dirt, the, the dirt, the slime. Stay away from the filth that's connected with the idols. Stay away from that. So the najasa here, although they may have najasa on their bodies because they don't know about istinja, but that's the secondary meaning. The primary meaning here is Najasa means shirk. So he says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala ali wa sallam, that cleanliness in our religion, that tuhur shatrul iman, cleanliness is half of the religion. Half of the religion is cleanliness. That's like his statement, Sallallahu Alaihi wa sallam, 
Hajj is Arafah, for an example. Hajj is Arafah. He wants to put importance on, don't miss out on that Hajj. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Dua is Ibadah. Yes, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ibadah, Umrah is Ibadah. But when he said that Dua is Ibadah, he wants to put a lot of emphasis on that Dua, that issue of Dua. So when he said that the religion, purity is half of the religion, he wants to put emphasis on the importance of a tahara. And the most important tahara, someone that may have OCD and they clean all the time, but if they have kuf and shif inside of them, inna man mushrikuna najis. So when Allah described the companions of the Prophet وسلم, and he described the masjid that was built for them to pray in it, he says subhanahu wa ta'ala, in that masjid are a group of people who love to purify themselves. And Allah loves those who purify themselves. So the first purity is purity away from shirk. If you're from Ahl Sunnah, Wal Jama'ah, you can't be a person walking around here believing in craziness. And this is one of the things that I witness and we all witness that there are a group of people who are an aqidah other than the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah and they want to argue and they want to fight and they want to say we're the real Ahl Sunnah <laughs> hey I can sit here you can sit here they can stand there and we can say all day I'm Ahl Sunnah you're Ahl Sunnah but uh, the proof is in the pudding the proof is in what you believe and how you are and how you behave it's not in these slogans and these words that we say Right now, this is a theoretic discussion. The real proof comes in application. So that's the most important characteristic of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. That the individual is free and pure of shirk and free from kufr. But also secondarily, and it's important, is that they clean themselves. Their masjid is clean. How can the masjid be Ahl Sunnah masjid when you go to it? And it has repugnant smells. And the people of the Sunnah know that the Malaika tata'adha mimma yata'adha minu banu ad. The Malaika, they don't like nasty smells. The Prophet didn't like nasty smells, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The companion said there were three things that he would never refuse. If you offered him three things, he would refuse some things. They offered him, Ya Rasulullah, you want to eat the duck? You want to eat the uh, lizard? He said, it's not from the food of my people. He refused it. The lady came and said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to get married. He said, I don't have any need. I don't want to get married. He refused some things. But there were three things he would never refuse. And one of those things that he wouldn't refuse is, if you brought him perfume, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would never say no. He put perfume on already, and you came with some more, he'll take it. And you came with some more, he'll take it. To the point that from his shama'il, from the way he is, his, his creation is that when he used to sweat those companions used to use that sweat for perfume some of the scholars said that was because he used to use so much of it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam others said it's just a mu'jiza others said that's just how the, it smelled to the companions but the point here is the importance of purity especially the purity of la'qida second of all from the many characteristics. And they're mean. It's what Shaykh al Islam Ibn Utaymiyyah said. Ibn Utaymiyyah, <coughs> in describing Ahl Sunnah, which he did many times in his writings, prolific scholar, tremendous scholar. When I performed Hajj this year, there's a lot of ikhtilaf between the scholars about Hajj because the Prophet وسلم, he only performed one Hajj. He only did it once. That's it. So the Companions saw different things. Some of them swore to some of the things that they saw that was rejected. And it was authentic, the hadith. Like Abdullah ibn Abbas saying that he married Maymuna when he was in Ihram and he swore to that. But the other companion said, no, we're not taking what Abdullah ibn Abbas said because he was young in this particular issue. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Utaymiyyah, when it comes to issues where there's a lot of ikhtilaf, one of the benefits of that man 
is that he makes the situation really easy for the person. He brings all the stuff together and gives you an opportunity to make your decision. And you'll see that in his fifth concerning Hajj. One of the things he took a lot of time to deal with, who are Ahl Sunnah and what do they do and who are they like? In saying this, doesn't mean Ibn Taymiyyah is masoom, doesn't mean everything he say we take, but he's one of those scholars who when it comes to this type of stuff, pay attention to what he says. When he used to describe Ahl Sunnah, he said Ahl Sunnah they are the most knowledgeable people, people concerning al khaliq Ahl Sunnah are the most knowledgeable people in regards to al khaliq And they are the most merciful people towards the khalq So they know Allah more than everybody else. And they're more gentle with the human beings. Muslims and non-Muslims. Animals, everybody. They're more merciful towards the creation than anybody else. It's the meaning of that kadam. And the Sunnah, they don't leave themselves ignorant about the religion. Ignorant to the degree where they can be taken advantage of. Ignorant to the degree where they don't have a clue why they do what they're doing. Some people in our Ummah will lie. The jahil of some people is to a degree that you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe the degree that some of the jahil, some things I can't even mention as examples because they're not appropriate. Like the guy who is in prison right now because he took advantage of some people. But the real crazy thing is, how would the women who went to him believe in that stuff? Someone has a problem in her marriage, she has a problem in her marriage, and she needs help. So she goes to a soothsayer, an imam who's a soothsayer. And he gives her magic. And after that doesn't work, he gives her some more magic. After that works, doesn't work, he offers her, you must do A, B, and C with me. And she winds up doing that two, three times. What person in their right mind, what person can allow them? And then when her conscience started to criticize her, and she couldn't hold it anymore, she went to the authorities and he got in trouble. And that's why he's in prison now. And when they asked her, why did you do that though? How? She said, I don't know. I was mesmerized. I don't know. Religion makes you do that. Because I go clubbing and I drink and I... To that degree, there's some point where the person has to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give you half of my wealth. I don't care what you say you can do. If I saw you flying in the sky, I'm not going to give you half of my wealth. Even if you flew in the sky, I'm not going to do it. So the ignorance, and the sunnah, not like that. Especially as it relates to the most important issue in the religion, and that is who Allah is. We've been created to worship Allah. And in addition to that, he taught us, showed us how to worship him. So that's the most important issue in the dunya. Al-Itlaq. There's nothing more important than that. Who is Allah? Kufar of Quraysh, they say, Ya Muhammad, Sif Lana Rabba, describe your Lord to us. Because we know Allah, we believe in Allah, but you have all these other names that you tell us about. Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Al Quddus, Al Salam. You have all of these names. Describe to us Allah. Is He made out of gold? Is He made out of copper? Is He made out of wood? Well, what, what is He? And Allah would address those issues for him. Those surahs that describe Allah Azza wa Jalla, like Surah Al Ikhlas, and other than that, describing what Allah does, what He doesn't do, who He is, where is He, these things that are not acceptable to be attributed to Him, like daughters and so on. So on. Dealt with everybody. I'm assuming they know these types of ways. And once the person knows that, he'll know himself. Easy way. He'll know people better when he addresses them. He didn't address them in a way where one of them said, "I don't want to come to the masjid anymore." And everybody knows these examples of the Bedouin that urinated in the masjid of the Allah of the lady that committed zina and she had to be stoned to death of the man that drank khamar and he was brought forth multiple times and flagged, flogged multiple times and the bee was gentle with the people he was gentle, gentle with those non-Muslims the Jewish boy, a Jewish boy is about to die, he's sick he took the time out to go 
to visit the Jewish boy. They had a connection. Jewish boy used to take care of him, used to work for him. They had a connection. And the Nabi went to the Jewish boy on his deathbed and gave him Dawah Allah. And then the person today, he doesn't see there's a need. He doesn't feel his hatred for the Yahud, for an example. It's to that degree. He doesn't see that they even have the right to get Dawah, even if he has some kind of relationship with him. So the point is, as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, they are the people who, they know Allah the most, they know their religion. So you guys who speak English, especially now. When I became a Muslim in 1986, I don't remember a single book of Aqida that was translated in English with the exception of Kitab al-Tawheed, which is a very good book. That was the only book that was available in 1986 translated into English. But now, 2015, 1437 years after the Hijra, now, 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 any, any Muslim who comes into this religion, he sees all of those books that have been translated. So many books like the Sharh al-Sunnah, Surah al-Sunnah, those types of books. Why did those scholars write those books? And who were those scholars? They're all scholars of Ahl al-Sunnah, all of them. As for the books of Aqidah of Ahl al-Bidah, most of us don't even know one book. What's the name of that book in Aqidah? Most of us. Someone said to you, name for me one book from Ahl al-Bidah in Aqidah. Most of us, I don't know. But everybody knows multiple books that the scholars of the Sunnah wrote in Aqidah. Why did they repeat writing those books over and over and all of them basically contain the same information? They wrote those books because Ahl al-Sunnah, they're the most knowledgeable people as it relates to Allah and they want to get that information out. They want to take that responsibility off of their shoulders and this is the responsibility of every masjid. It's the responsibility of every masjid to make sure the Jewish boy in the hospital, the Jewish boy in the street, the Jewish boy wherever he happens to be from our neighbors and so forth and people who we go to school with, that they hear this message, that they also brought inside. So I can say, Ahl sunnah Ahl sunnah But the proof is in the pudding. Where is my dawah to those individuals? From the characteristics of Ahl sunnah wal jamaah ikhwani is they don't make taqlid. They don't make taqlid. Taqlid al-a'ma, blind following. And I have to explain that, I have to explain that. Blind following is when you take someone's opinion and you don't know why. You don't know what you're, why you're doing. The boys who sat in the back, another one comes in and he just sits with them. And if you ask them, what are you doing? He doesn't know why he's sitting there. That's taqlid. He's doing what they're doing. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he used to tell this community, don't be copycats. Don't be a copycat. Don't be a person who says, if the people do this, I'm gonna do it. And if they do that, I'm gonna do that. Are you guys aware of what happened to that lady from Ahl Sunnah, inshallah, in Afghanistan? I saw a documentary that was focused upon a boy who was 16 years old from Afghanistan. He was going to relieve his father from the job and he was just minding his own business. But when he arrived, close to the job, he saw a crowd of people surrounding the girl. He asked, what's going on? They said, he, she burnt the Quran. She disrespected the Quran. So without asking any questions, he got in the front of the crowd, picked up a big boulder, and you can see him dropping the boulder on the girl's head. And they killed that girl. May Allah make her from the Shuhada and put her in Jannah. They charged that boy with murder and a few other people because they have him on the camera doing something. When they interviewed the boy later, when he came to his senses and he regretted what he did, especially when he found out that the girl was telling the people, hey, 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 don't do this stuff that you're doing around here. Don't do these things at the shrine and what you're doing. Don't make this ship in this school. Don't do this. It's not permissible. That's what she was doing. She was giving Dawah to Allah. And it killed them. The point here is, the boy, the boy, he just jumped in without asking any questions. They asked him, why? Why did you do that? 
He said, I don't know. I was just overwhelmed. The emotions, the crowd, it was shaitan. And now he's in a world of trouble. May Allah Ta'ala forgive him, have mercy upon him and those other people. The point here is, the Muslim is not like that. The Muslim is not a copycat. He just goes and he says because everybody else is saying. He does because everybody else is doing. He has to ask questions. He gets a text message, and the text message says, this and this and this and that and this and this and that. He's not quick to send that off, just because it came to him. And someone said to him, hey, now get the reward by sending it out to the next person. The Muslim is going to say, no, this was me that this was talking about. I wouldn't want people to send this out. What's the religious benefit of this? And is this true? That's what the Muslim is going to do. He's going to weigh the situation. He has a religion that tells him and holds him to that standard. <coughs> so the people of the Sunnah and the Sunnah, they don't make taqlid, al-a'ma, blind following, when they have the ability not to do such a thing, no matter who <coughs> is on the other side. It could be the government, it could be his political party, it could be his father, it could be the elders, the uncles, it could be the rich, no matter who it is. And that's a discussion all into itself. Abdullah ibn Abbas, when they asked him, Hey Abdullah ibn Abbas, which Hajj is the best Hajj? There are three types of Hajj that you can make, depending upon your situation. <coughs> There's an easy one, a middle one, one is kind of more difficult. But depending on your situation and your money and your ability, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appears to have been a Qarin when he performed Hajj. That's when you make Hajj and you don't come out of your Ihram. But some of the companions said, no, he made it fraud. But clearly his Hadith told us the best Hajj was the other one, where you make Umrah, come out of your Ihram, and then you make Hajj. And there are many Hadith that show that's the case. <coughs> Abdullah bin Abbas, the people said to him, hey, Ibn Abbas, which Hajj is the best Hajj? Which one? He said a tamattur, the one that the prophet said a tamattur, the one where you shed blood and you say the baker, the woman, the baker, a lot, you become hoarse. He said that's the best hajj. They said, but your father Umar didn't say that, and Abu Bakr didn't say that. They don't agree with you. Abu Bakr and Umar, when we asked them that question, they said in the Quran. Abdullah bin Abbas started wiping off his clothes and he started getting up. He said, hey, I'm getting out of here because I'm afraid that Allah is going to send rocks down from the sky to destroy you people. You ask me something and I tell you that the Prophet said it and you tell me Abu Bakr and Umar? You tell me Abu Bakr and Umar? He said, I'm getting out of here. And he didn't put Abu Bakr and Umar down with that kanab. He didn't put them down with that kanab. It's just that he's one of the leaders of Ahl Sunnah. And Ahl Sunnah, they don't raise people up to that degree where people go above the Nabi. They don't make taqlid like that. They don't see anybody as being masoom other than the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there are so many examples of that for these young people. That companion of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Zayd ibn Thabit, when Abu Bakr and Umar came to him and they told him, hey, many of the people who memorize the Quran, they have been killed. And we want you now to sit down and bring this Quran together in a book form. That's what, you, what we want you to do. I am Abu Bakr and I'm the Khalifa. And this is Umar. And he's my deputy, my na'ib. And they're both sitting with a young man. He was about 17, 18 years old. This is what we're doing. We're putting this responsible responsibility on you. Zayd ibn Thabit said, I'm not doing it. He said, Wallahi, I'm not going to do anything that the Prophet didn't tell us to do. Uh, the Prophet didn't tell us to do that. And he refused to do it until they started proving to him the wisdom of what he was saying. So the young person, he doesn't care of the position and the status of the one who's in front of him. He doesn't disrespect his position or status. But if he's from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, this person is not masoom. That's the meaning of a taqlid here. As for a person taking a position in the religion. He doesn't have the ability to figure the issue out. So he's going to follow Al Imam Abu Hanifa blindly. He doesn't know what the delil is. He doesn't know the situation. He says, I'm just going to follow Al Imam Abu Hanifa. 
and the issue is bigger than him, and I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is the individual who claims to be from Ahlul Sunnah, but he's setting individuals up as being, for an example, the one that we all have to listen to during the days of Al Hajj. You know, guys, when we were over there, you don't want to waste your time because there are ibadat over there you don't find anywhere else. When you walk around the Kaaba, when you walk around the Kaaba, making tawaf, at any time, before Hajj starts, you just go to the masjid to walk around the Kaaba, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, whenever. Or go when it's hot because you think a lot of people are not going to be here at uh, 12 o'clock noon, but it's still a million people there. Anyway, you're walking around the Kaaba, every right step is a hasana. Every left step is a sin. That's only in Mecca. It's only in Mecca. You're not going to find that anywhere else. You walk from the masjid, from your house to the masjid, you'll get that reward. But over there, you are walking to the masjid, you get inside of the masjid, you walk around. Read by that, that only can be done there. So therefore, when you get there, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. So some of the brothers said, hey, we have to go see Sheikh so-and-so. We must go see Sheikh so-and-so. But in going to see Sheikh so-and-so, we will miss out a lot of ibadah for that day. And when we go to see the Sheikh, all the kalam is going to be is, he said this, he said that, and he said, that's all the kalam is. So we said, I don't, we don't want to do that. So some of them went. They came back. We said, how was it? The brother said, mashallah, mashallah. He doesn't speak Arabic. Said to him, what did the Sheikh talk about? He said, I don't know, but it was deep. I don't know, but it was deep, it was heavy. And you know why, Ikhwan? The reason for that is because we're into the Sheikh stuff, the Sheikh worship. The Sheikh said, our religion, Allah said and the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sheikh is not the Dalil. And for this reason, when I came back, I started a new class reading the book of Al Imam al Tirmidhi. Al-Shama'il al muhammadiyah To reconnect the community with our Nabi and our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Don't get it twisted and don't misunderstand what I'm saying We have to respect ulama in our religion Scholars in our religion, we respect them The guy who memorized the Quran, we respect him The scholar who is a real scholar, we're going to respect him but We don't worship him If he comes and he says something that goes against the religion We don't make excuses and say some we say hey we don't follow him in these types of issues so we want to go back to that way of Ahlul Sunnah making a distinction of how to respect the ulama but not raising them above their position as the people of Ahlul Kitab did and this was one of the problems from the characteristics Ikhwani of Ahlul Sunnah one of the most important ones as well is the clarity of the religion and wudur in the religion. Allah Azza wa sent down a religion and He taught us everything that you need to know. It's just the responsibility of each and every individual to learn what he can learn according to his ability. When you're a brand new Muslim and you're praying and you're reading Surah Al Fatiha, you don't understand what you're saying and you're just following the movements of the people who are next to you. And when you pray by yourself, you pray, but you don't get that spiritual feeling because you really don't know what you're doing at the beginning. But as time goes on and you start to comprehend more and you spend time with people and you're reading more and you're learning more, then you start to feel better about what you're doing. But if you leave yourself ignorant, you don't know anything about the religion. You don't know what's up, what's down. You don't know what's the truth and what's not true, especially during these days person is calling you to something, he's saying that it's Islam, and it's against the religion of Islam. And Allah won't be pleased with you because you're doing that. People of the Sunnah take pride in, any Muslim should take pride in, my religion explained everything to me, everything I need to know. Everything. The ayat of the Quran. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَمَا مِنْ دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا طَائِرٍ يَتِيرُ بِجَنَاحِهِ this ayat, there is not any animal, any animal 
human, any animal, and anything, no god but, anything that's found on the face of the earth. There's nothing on the face of the earth, and there is no bird that flaps his wings in the sky, except that they are all nations like you, tribes like you. And then Allah said, we didn't leave out of this religion anything. Pay attention to this. The ulama of a tafsir, some of them have different specializations. But they said, every single surah of the Quran has a connection with the surah that comes after it. There's a reason why Surah Al-Baqarah is after Surah Al-Fatiha. And Ali Imran is after Al-Baqarah. And on and on. So the surah has a connection to the surah that's before it. And it has some connection to the surah that comes after it. And every ayat of the Quran, every ayat has a connection to the ayat that came before it and the ayat that came after it. Now some of you have graduated from the university 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So you have to keep reading up on your profession. You have to stay relevant and on top of things. All those young new people come out and take your job. You get outsourced, they give your job to people in China and India. So you have to stay on top of your profession, reading new things. If we just spend some of that time learning the tafsir of the Quran and the sciences of the Quran like that, we will go a far way. In this ayat, there is no animal on the face of the earth, no bird flying in its wings in the sky, except their nation like unto you. And then the end of the ayah said, we haven't left anything out of this book. So the scholar said, every surah is connected to the surah that went before and the surah that came after. Every ayah of the Quran is connected to the ayah that came before and the one after. And inside of the ayah, inside of the ayah, they said that every ayah, the beginning of it has a connection to the last part. So what's the connection that Elijah just mentioned? There's not any animal on the sky, the, the earth, any bird flying around. And then the last part of the ayah is, we didn't leave anything out of this book. It's the connection. Animals are nations like us. Birds, they're nations like us. And we didn't leave anything out of this book. The connection is what Abu Dhar said about the ayah. He said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to sit with us. And if a bird flew, he would tell us everything we need to know about that bird. Everything. If a bird flew while we were sitting there, he would tell us everything we needed to know about that bird. Hey, you people, that is the crow. Don't eat the meat of the crow. That bird over there, he has that beak that can rip the rats and the rabbits apart. You can't eat any bird that has that thing. That bird that has talons and he rips the prey, picks them up. You can't, he told us, everything. The bird will come your Mokiyama for the one who shot the bird and just killed him and left him. Target practice. The bird is going to come and say, oh my Lord, ask him, why did he kill me? The bird is going to ask that question. So what do you think is the case with a human being? With a human being? So everything, if one of you wants to slaughter the bird, sharpen your knife and spare him suffering. Everything you need to know about the bird. Before you eat that bird, eat with your right hand, say Bismillah. Everything you want to know about your religion has been explained. How to die, how to be born, how to get married, how to dress, how to sit in the masjid, everything. Nothing has been left out. That's for Ahlul Sunnah and Jama'ah. As for just the regular Muslim, just the Muslim, and he really doesn't have a clue concerning a lot of his religion. And I think this is why we have to be really gentle and easy with our Muslim brothers and sisters. Gentle and easy with them in different ways. One way is, not looking at yourself as if you're better than everybody. You know when they don't know. Not like that. Prophet, no. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But didn't make people feel like that. So we have to be gentle that way. And we also have to be gentle and easy with these people, our brothers and sisters, because this is how some people are being taught. This is the religion of some people. He doesn't really think that he's doing something wrong. The way he is with his wife, he doesn't know that that's wrong. He really doesn't think that it's wrong. Because his culture put that in his head, for an example. 
She doesn't wear hijab because she thinks that that's okay. She doesn't see herself as having suho, uh, having a tabarruj and uh, being a lady who is uh, being this sofur. She she doesn't feel in that that that's what's going on. So I think it's really important in the time that we're living that we have to take it easy with these people. Last one that I want to mention, Hwani, from the many ones that I mentioned and I put together, is Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They make it their business to stay united with the community, with the Muslims. They do everything in their power, their ability, not to be a reason or the reason that Muslims are divided amongst themselves. That's why they call Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, because they're with the group, they're with the group. And don't be like the Mushrikeen, those people who divided up into their religion and they all became different groups. The ayah said, remember, remember the favor of Allah upon you. When you were enemies to one another, Allah brought you people together. That was the condition that the Prophet came into, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was worse than ours. The Qawmi and the Asabiyah of the Arabs of Jahiliyyah was very heated. It was tough. It was hot. And the Prophet came into that situation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he showed and he proved how that disease and that sickness can be conquered. But he dealt with, he dealt with a group of core individuals who were the example. As for the other people like Abu Lahab and Abu Jahan and people like that, they're like the people that exist today. I mean, they're just not going to get to the message. They're not going to buy into the message. But the core group of people that became Muslims, when they heard that message of Islam being against racism, saying that it stinks, racism, it has a repugnant smell, as he told the Ansar and the Muhajireen who were about to fight each other. He said, leave this thing alone because it stinks. He said that the racist person, the racist person is like the, is like the beetle, B-E-E-T-L-E, -E -E, the desert beetle. You know, the desert beetle is in the desert when the camel drops his uh, defecation, he goes to the toilet, Karamakum Allah, the camel, or any animal in the desert, they put their um, defecation, they eat, digest it, it comes out. There's a beetle that goes in the, in the desert, he just be pushing that all over the place, that's his job. He's just pushing it from here to the other wall, that's his job. The Prophet said the racist is like that. He said some hadith, wallahi, I don't even think it's wise, for me to tell you these hadith, although they are hadith, because some people may get upset. And Wallahi the Prophet said, addressing the mentality and the ignorance of the racists. I mean, some really tough hadith. And he wasn't a person who is uh, in his language. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wasn't uh, using profanity. But he used some descriptions to deal with the intellect of the people who were racist to show how bad and nasty this thing is. Like the hadith that he mentioned Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to his companions, if you see anybody bragging, like the people in the times of Jahiliyyah used to brag, he told his community, if you see anybody bragging about, I'm an Arab, I'm Iraqi, what are you? I'm this, I'm that. He said, if you see anybody do that, then tell them to bite his father's private part and don't sugarcoat it. Because that's where he came from. So if he wants to brag about where he came from, then that's where you came from. What is there to brag about that? And the reason why he said that was to shock the people into what they were doing, to make them think. No one in his right mind, no one in his right mind, when he thinks about it in that way, is going to say that's something to be proud about. He's going to say that's something nasty. And then when a person knows how the Nabi was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he hears a hadith like that for the first time, he says, did the Prophet really say that? Yes, he said that, Wallahi. And I don't advise that that hadith is used in every assembly because you won't tell people if there's something they don't understand, it could be a problem. But this is a community that I believe you people can digest and handle and understand what the point is.
he was speaking to the intellect and the mind of the races. So concerning Ahl Sunnah, Ahl Sunnah, they make every effort to be the people who hold on to unity. But not unity, empty slogan. I tell you straight up, and I've told you this before. And if you go to the YouTube, when we gave the talk about the Mount Badr, the Mount Uhud, and that problem, when you go to that mountain in that heat, and you see the grave of those companions, and you realize all of those sacrifices that those companions made, and then someone comes, and he starts to curse those companions. It's really difficult to really not become angry to the point where you want to do something to the person. And you shouldn't do anything to him because there's always a better way to handle it. But how in the world is someone going to say about those companions who made those sacrifices? We didn't do, I'm telling you, the heat of Arabia is something else. And those companions were traveling from Medina to Tobuk. They were traveling all over the place with no food, no money, poor. And they went out and they made the ultimate sacrifice. And then here comes somebody and his stomach is really big. His life is easy. And he starts to say that those companions are kuffar and say crazy things about them. It's really difficult for your blood not to boil. So if someone came to me and said, hey, let us unite with this individual. I'm going to say not in a million years. I'm not going to smile at you. Not in a million years would I unite with that situation ever. But there are some things that are universal. And we can unite and cooperate. Cooperate is a better word. I cooperate in that his child goes to the same school that my child goes to. A public school for an example and now Muslim children go to the public school and they want to teach sex education in the public school so we as parents go to the public school and we cooperate together and say look look we don't want this for our children we don't want you to teach our children in America about Halloween we don't want you to teach our children about Columbus next month there's a holiday in America called Thanksgiving where they eat turkey and things like that. And it's all built on a lie. Christopher Columbus from Spain went to America, discovered America. When he got there, he discovered the Native American Indians and he killed them and decimated them. And he did a lot of bad things. And they were telling us this story all our lives, growing us up, and we were believing that. So now people are saying, we don't want our children to learn that. I'll go and I'll cooperate with these people for something like that. As for in the deep, there's no cooperation. So I assume that they tried to stay cooperating. They tried to stay united. The Prophet said there are three things. The heart of the Muslim will never be against it. First thing is having ikhlas to Allah. His heart should never be about that. He has purity. Second thing is that he gives nasiha to the leader who's been put over him. The third thing is that he takes care of sticking with the group of Muslims to the best of his ability. And in these types of masjids, like this masjid, where there are different ethnic groups, that's a tall order. Because the reality is, today when I gave the khutbah, I saw a lot of faces. I said, it looks like the akrat, they grew, their numbers grew. So they seem like they're the minority, they're the majority now. They have issues that are peculiar to them over there and here, that make them who they are. And then Pakistan is the same way. The revert is the same way. The Arabs from the other Muslim world are the same way. We got men, we got women, we got old, we got youngsters. That is a power keg for disunity. Because everybody is so different. Everybody is so different. But the one thing that is the unifying force and factor is understanding this religion the way those companions did. If we don't do that, then it's going to be drama. So in India, in India, my advice to you brothers is be from the people of Ahl Sunnah and those issues that I'm in, that I mentioned today about having a Tawheed and not having shirk in your life. The issue about looking at only Prophet Muhammad as being masoom and don't have gulu with anybody, no matter who he 
happens to be. Never, ever, ever think one person has all of the truth. Everyone has to go back to the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you don't make that your business to start learning little by little, you'll be like a piece of paper, that the leaf that falls off of the tree. You'll go wherever the wind blows you. So if some guys catch you over here who are criminals, Muslims who are criminals, they can make you believe, hey, let's go rob the bank. We can rob the bank. You may do something like that because you didn't learn your religion. You may get met by some guys over here who say, hey, 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 Islam is natural. It teaches you to take care of your health and everything. Let's smoke weed because it's natural. It's a plant from the earth. You go with those people over here. Then the third group come and they say, hey, 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 hey. You know Ali is the best companion. He did this, he did that. All the other companions are not any good. And you'll be one of those people. But if you read and learn your religion, you stay around people with violence, you'll be okay. Inshallah. So you have to make a lot of dua. You, you. You have to make a lot of supplication to ask Allah. Make this one of the duas you always remember. Allah guide me to what's right. Guide me to the right people. Don't guide me to the people too rough, too tough. And the people too laxed and too easy. You want to be the people in the middle who know what they're doing. And everybody make mistakes and you're going to make mistakes inshallah along the way. Ikhwani, be of the people of Ahl Sunnah as it relates to the unity in this masjid. The unity in this masjid. There are many things that go on in every masjid. We're not going to be happy with them. It's just the nature of the thing. So the people, everybody has to look at the situation you have to uh, put your best foot forward in trying to solve the problem. This is what we wanted to, to present to you in a way of a remembrance. And we ask the lives with you to accept it from us and to accept it from you, inshallah, and to help us to apply it. I originally was supposed to talk about a dawah and the importance of a dawah today. But uh, we changed that up. I was blessed, as I told you, to have made hajj with some people who were from this... They're not really from this masjid, but they're from Huddersfield. But they were in the masjid today. And I was shocked when I came in and I saw them. It was about five of them all together, actually. So we were going to give the khutbah about the importance of a dawah. And I want to take this time out to uh, encourage you brothers, really. Like I told you, what are we here for? We're here to worship Allah and make our religion spread. Inshallah, we got to make our religion spread. So everybody has to get in where he fits in. Get into your lane and do what you can do. You may not be that guy who's going to come and give this talk, but you can be that guy who's going to purchase the literature. You can be that guy who's going to go to the city center with the table and to support the effort. You're just standing there just to support. You don't say anything, but you're just standing there. That's all. But if you ask a question that you do know the answer to, you do what you have the ability to do. And lastly, everybody, I believe, has the ability to financially help the situation. So we got a group of brothers who are here, who are working with the masjid, but nonetheless, they are in need of your financial support to keep the dawah going forward. So I'm going to encourage you brothers, inshallah, azawajal, today to help them out to offset some of the uh, liabilities that they've been incurring along uh, the dawah efforts that they have been given, that they've been given. They'll accept it from them as well.